All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2022 Honors Distinguished Lecture Series hosted by the Community College of Baltimore County's Honors Program. This program tonight is generously funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation's Humanities for All initiative. This initiative allows honor students to learn more about the humanities through experiential learning experiences and specialized lecture series. For tonight's lecture, we are joined by culinary historian, Michael Twitty. Michael Twitty is a culinary historian and a food writer from the Washington DC area. He blogs at afroculinaria.com. He's also featured on Bazaar Foods America with Andrew Zimmern, Many Rivers to Cross with Henry Louis Gates, and most recently, Taste of the Nation with top chef Padna Lakshmi. HarperCollins released Twitty's The Cooking Gene in 2017, tracing his ancestry through food from Africa to America and from slavery to freedom. A finalist for the Kirkus Prize, the Art of Eating Prize, and the third place winner of Barnes & Noble's Discover New Writers Awards in Nonfiction. The Cooking Gene won the 2018 James Beard Award for Best Writing as well as Book of the Year, making him the first Black author so awarded. His piece on visiting Ghana and Bon Appetit was included in Best Food Writing in 2019 and was nominated for a 2019 James Beard Award. His next book, Rice, became available through UNC Press in 2021. Kosher Soul, his follow-up to The Cooking Gene, was published in August of 2022 through HarperCollins. Michael has a hit spice line based on the cooking gene and a recent special guest appearance on Michelle Obama's Waffles and Mochi show on Netflix. Michael can also be found on Masterclass Online where he teaches tracing your roots through food. He is also a National Geographic Explorer, a TED Fellow, and a member of the 2022 Time 100 Next class. Tonight, Michael will walk us through a lecture on cultural appropriation, followed by some time with the students for a question and answer. So welcome, Michael. We're happy to have you with us here tonight. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So um, this is cultural appropriation quickly became the expression to be, you know, um, the hot expression in the media right along with, um, in my day, reverse racism. I don't believe in reverse racism because I don't believe that um, something based on power like racism can be reversed quite so easily. Um, when it comes to appropriation, cultural appropriation, what we're really talking about isn't the sharing of culture. In a healthy multicultural society, um, Culture is shared without exploitation. Culture is shared organically. Culture is shared between groups of people and it's not based on um, someone having a deficit or being hurt. Cultural appropriation is the opposite of cultural diffusion in a healthy multicultural society. In other words, somebody's losing something because somebody is gaining something out of proportion. There is a power imbalance things are being used and extracted and exploited for entertainment purposes or for money purposes, but the people who are creating the original thing don't have the benefit of their culture. In fact, it may even be used against them in certain ways. And so we have a lot of different competing views about what cultural appropriation is, but recently there've been a few things that have come out to the public eye that I would really like to talk about. Let me start right here real quick. Um, I have a whining dog in the background, for, forgive me. Um, one of the big issues that I saw this past year was with the comedian um, Aquafina, Asian American. And there are people who were very against Aquafina using what they call a black scent. I understand, I get it. Because one of the issues that African-Americans, of which I am one, um, have faced more than any other group, actually, is the rehashing and reuse and bad copying of our culture, whatever form that may take. Linguistics, food, and I focus on food, um, 
dance, um, music, you can go on, you know, our spiritual life. Um, it's gotten to the point where we joke about, you know, people affecting um, our, our identity and making fun of us, but also exploiting us. You know, is Aquafina an appropriator? Is Kim Kardashian an appropriator? Um, is Harry Styles an appropriator? Or are these people simply using their power platform and privilege in ways that may be irresponsible vis-a-vis -vis Black culture? And all of those possibilities can be true. Um, sometimes people aren't appropriating, but they are participating in something that is, a, is in a space that doesn't necessarily belong to them. And even saying that can be a very um, charged phrase. What do you mean a space belongs to a, someone or culture or background? I use words from all over the place. Let's tell different kinds of music, I different kinds of food. Does mean I'm an appropriator? Okay, fair enough. But what do we say about political figures like Stephen Miller, for example, who worked in the last administration, who led efforts to deport um, Latino asyl asylum seekers and was very fond of going to the most gourmet Latin American and Mexican restaurants, but had no qualms about eating the food while abusing the people. Um, that's one form of cultural appropriation. Another form I would say is one of my, one of my clear classic examples is how some people will market a food tradition in a town or a place. Um, for example, the story of hot chicken in Nashville. Um, there is an establishment run by a white, younger white man who has, you know, the power, the platform, the privilege to open up in a very Tony sort of, you know, rich area of Nashville, whereas Nashville hot chicken began during Jim Crow segregation in the city. And it was Prince's that began the hot chicken tradition. But Prince's has not really benefited from the shift in money and resources, and also has suffered from its historical legacy as a place where Jim Crow manifested itself and people were kept separate and money was not always in flow. So we look at these situations and we really begin to understand that another part of cultural appropriation is the fact that the culture creators often creating their culture in marginalized and oppressed circumstances are also sort of the losing end. And that's what makes us so upset. Now, other people don't always have the same attitude towards cultural appropriation as we do. For example, um, I remember a couple of years ago, Adele uh, had her hair braided a certain way, was participating in Carnival. And a lot of African-Americans were like, what is she doing? That's not cool, or, or that's ridiculous. Whereas the Caribbean community in Great Britain was like, good for her. It's good for her. We're so glad that someone of her stature is participating in our culture. But I think that's the phrase that we're going to keep remembering in our discussion tonight is that, you know, having the keys to the issue, having the material, having the source code really matters versus feeling as though you don't have that source code. And I think for many, 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 many reasons, African-Americans in particular, Black Americans in particular, have felt sort of a, um, have really felt the pinch of this issue in ways that other people haven't. You know, if you go to West Africa, for example, and you, you talk about traditional Af West African spiritualities, you know, they have no problem with the British or East Asian person or something else, or Brazilian person who is not obviously Black coming and learning the religion and participating in it. Whereas for us, we get triggered about that because of the spaces that we've been in. And the spaces that we've been have been highly segregated and redlined to the point where it's very difficult for us to tell whether a space is free or not. Whether a space is a place where we can actually um, exercise our culture and be independent in that and not have it being used. You know, for many people in America, you know, an ethnic restaurant is a cheap eats when it's owned by the people. But when it's owned 
in the larger community and make crosses over in the mainstream, then it becomes a gourmet establishment. And we're not in control of the menu or the ideas about the food. And in the food world that I'm a part of, part of the issue is that there are very few books and cookbooks published about the food traditions of people of the African diaspora and African Atlantic and African Americans, and very few writers and editors and gatekeepers, people who are able to make sure that those voices get heard. Um, they're not out there. Whereas other communities and other diasporas have a much more, um, I would say, they've created a lot more infrastructure to support their artists and their workers. And it's not always us on us. It can be on the world where we don't get those jobs. We're not expected in certain industries. And we're just basically denied the opportunity to express ourselves on equal terms with other cultures. So I can talk about this in this kind of like economic clipped way, kind of quick and dirty because I've had to deal with it. You know, being an African-American in the American food scene is not easy, especially when it comes to telling our story. When I wrote The Cooking Gene, which some of you may have written, we have read, um, I remember going to the Roger Smith Cookbook Conference in 2012 in New York. And I was one of, I think about, um, of all the people there, there were five men of color out of 300 some people. And out of the 300 some people, there were only about 40 or so people of color across the board, um, mostly women, um, mostly not black. Those of us who are black, probably about um, 10, uh, 10 of the 20, and one of, you know, three or four black males, well, the, one of two or three black males, and the rest South Asian and East Asian. Um, and just weren't represented. And here were the, the biggest voices in the food world. Here were the people who were supposed to make things move and spread ideas. And we just simply weren't there. And we weren't there because they didn't think to invite more of us. There wasn't a space made for us. And by the way, we can do things other than just the things people associate with us. They associate soul food or Afro-Latin, Afro-Caribbean food with us. We can do that and then more so. But it wasn't as if those voices were being were being um, promoted. And I remember the moment where I pitched The Cooking Gene, which is a book that I wrote, tracing my ancestry from Africa to America, from slavery to freedom through food, um, getting at the roots of our family. And for those of you who are African-American or part of the African diaspora, you understand that part of the reason why the appropriation happens, and this power imbalance happens because of enslavement and its after effects which um, people extracted everything they could out of, out of our cultures and then left the rest and then blamed us for those things that they did not appropriate or half appropriated and said, this is what's holding you back as a culture, as a people. Um, those kind of negative sort of like um, reflections are what led me to think about what soul food really meant to me, what African-American vernacular cuisine really meant to me um, because I wanted to understand how is it that so much of our culture has been used in certain ways and sometimes against us? But at the same point in time, um, we're supposed to think that our culture is behind or not as healthy or lower class. Where did all these assumptions come from? Or as much an important part of that book as how did our food sustain us, transmit our culture, keep our connections with the homeland going over hundreds of years, but also sustained black identity and black joy against black trauma. So even telling that story, I remember getting up there and talking to the one of the one of the agents, and I was so excited. And she was like, How do you know someone's even gonna like your story or be interested in your family's story? And here I am, they told us point blank. They said, Hey, you know, we want different voices. We want somebody who's different. Well, all I saw was white women in that room. And I was the only man of color, period, period. And this was a packed room of like, I don't know, 80 some people. And they said, we want somebody who has over 800 followers on Twitter. Well, that was back when you could have 800 followers on Twitter and, and be somebody. And I said, I've got 1,200. I'm, I'm good. I'm ready to go. 
And it was this moment of rushing up there and learning that, oh, but hold up. As long as you're telling a black story, how do we know? Well, why is it that when my story is told through somebody else's mouth, piece and lens and, and, and viewpoint, that it's so much more exciting and interesting? But when I do it, I have to transcend who I am for you to listen to me. And I don't think that's fair or even useful. You need to hear our stories. And then, y'all, I met this lady who was, I was pitching this thing to, and she said to me, oh, I don't think that sounds very interesting. Now, think about this. Here I am, African-American, tracing my ancestry back through historical documents and DNA going back to the 17th and 18th centuries, going back across the ocean to West Africa, following those ships, following the people, uh, people who were actually in my bloodline. And this woman says, oh, that's not interesting. You should write a book about my husband's family. I'm like, oh, Lord. She said in her very pronounced deep Southern accent, she says, my husband's family came from, went to Texas from Tennessee during the Civil War to escape the Yankees. I'm like, oh, my God, please don't do this to me. Please don't do this to me. In the first wagon, not the first wagon, she said it was my husband's, my husband's people. In the second wagon, oh God, don't say it, were all their, their, their possessions. And the third wagon were your people. I said, oh my God. So not only are you insulting me by saying, my sto our story shouldn't be centered because I'm trying to write a blueprint for other people of African descent to sort of trace their ancestry back and use their food journey to anchor their heritage. But she was like, you should tell the story of my white husband's slave owning family. That's more interesting. Like hell it is. No, how that cornbread and that buttermilk and that glass preserved us, how that okra soup and that fried chicken and barbecue preserved us, how those you know meals that we made as a community for home goings and for births and for weddings sustained us. That's important to me. And all the traditions that we brought and words we brought from West Central Africa to America and then took that same culture and imprinted that same culture on white Southerners and indigenous people and other people, that to me is a, is a miracle story. So I worked hard to make sure that that story came to life and it paid off. But in the background is this whole narrative of, well, when a black person says something or sings something, we have to make all these questions about it. But when other people do it, it's an innovation. Why is Elvis still the, the you know, in some people's minds, the king of rock and roll? When we know that without the various women and men in the field, he would never have been anywhere near that type of music, let alone learn it and to translate it to the world. And it's not, it's not about pushing back against the people who are the translators. Sometimes cultures need translators. Um, for other people outside that culture to really get it and to participate in it. That's not the problem. The problem is, is what do you claim? What do you think you own? Who are you? What space do you come in? Are you, are you giving boundaries for respect or are you just trampling over what people's heritage is in the public eye because you can? And so all these, all these kind of like themes are what we need to have a genuine conversation about cultural appropriation, especially in food, but in all of its forms, and acknowledging the difference between cultural diffusion, cultural appropriation, between respect and disrespect of a person's culture. Let's uh, let's open it up. Chef Twitty, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. No, no, no. I I am writing down vigorously. And I hope over on the comment section, if those that are joining us, if they have comments, if they have questions, please put them on the side. I'm going to go ahead and start with a couple questions for you. Sure. Before I jump off into the questions that I had um, prescribed, I want to go back and see, can we touch on a little bit of what you talked about before? Sure. I found it really interesting when you said uh, we have to determine whether a space is free or not. And I'd love to hear how you go about uh, delineating whether a space is free mm -hmm. in 2022. 
what are you know what what does the representation look like? Who are the voices? Who are the writers? Who are the editors? Who are the agents? Who are the managers? Um, there's a lot of it takes a lot of people to get a message out, to get a book out, to get an album out, to get you know a cookbook out, to get a show out. You know who is delineating this matters, and what for? So I'll give you an example of the reason why it's so important for us to know the infrastructure. Um, in 2020, of course, we had a, a um, one of our many flashpoints, endless flashpoints of um, racial healing, reconciliation, and even rebellion. Um, and in that same year, we just happened to have, it was a collision of the pandemic, um, of the protests, of us demanding um, accountability from law enforcement and from the state. And there's a stupid fly here. And one of the things that got me was I had done an article that year for Bon Appetit. This kind of goes into what we're talking about. So Bon Appetit is the food magazine. Um, they had previously hired an African-American writer for something, and they did not pay her appropriately, did not pay her. And when we had the article out um, about Juneteenth, our Juneteenth article was about me and a um, gathering of Muslim chefs in Philadelphia having a halal Juneteenth. The author of the piece was me, Black. Mm -hmm. All the chefs were Black. The foods, the photographer was Black. The food stylist was Black. Everybody but the editor at the magazine was Black. And the editor specifically wanted to help us achieve the goal of having a virtually all Black production of this article, this piece okay. for Bon Appetit. So people got mad because they were like, oh, this sister didn't get paid. I didn't know who this sister was until... You know, I put the word out about the article and they were calling me a traitor and all that other stuff and oh, Chef Omar Tate a traitor. And it's just like kind of stupid because Chef Omar trying to build in Philadelphia, build community and build our own business, our own situation. So um, it was really disturbing, but mostly because we I realized something in order for us to truly have complaint and talk about these things and work through them and negotiate our issues, we have to know the industries we're critiquing. Mm. We also have to understand that there's more than one job for us to have in these fields. You know, it's not just being a chef. It's not just being a sommelier, sommelier or being nutritionist or being an agronomist or being um, a garde manger or doing mise en place or any, any number of jobs within the culinary world. It's also the people who are doing the work of, you know, saying who gets to write what, who takes a picture of what, all of that matters. You and I both know that when, when people engage in photography, if you're not doing that appropriately, as an African-American, you may not come out right because they don't have to take our picture. Right. Or somebody may know better than another person. I mean, I really want the person who's going to give me the best look and best representation. Correct. So it was a real, it was a real cluster because, you know, we had to deal with people, we, we, you know, this poor sister had not got paid yet, but she's angry at us for doing this. I'm like, we need to work with the same editor, but we have to know these fields. So knowing what is a free space means, it means that the space that you're working in has room for you. You can expand, you can invite other creators of color in to do the work. You can strong you can make strong advocacy for your own. That's what this means. And a quick follow up to that. For some of these spaces where they wouldn't be deemed free, how are you seeing people in your industry create free spaces and spaces that previously weren't? Screen. You know, my friend um Ileana um Maisonette just published a book called Diasporican. I'm very proud of this sister. She um, really went, she, the book is about Puerto Rican food outside of Puerto Rico. And, you know, as an Afro-Latina, she really 
she really went there with this book. But I mean, she literally had people telling her things like, oh, you know, um, Ileana, people are really going to be interested in this. It's not really. But then you would, she was like, well, when it was came to other writers, only kind of writing they wanted from her about Puerto Rico was trauma because mm -hmm. the earthquake and other things happened there and, and the hurricane and other things. So they were just like, hey, let's, you know, talk about that hurricane some more. Mm -hmm. And she's like, oh, but I don't live in Puerto Rico. I live here in America with other Puerto Rican communities and my work is about this. And so one publication was trying to force her to write about these traumatic issues. Well, lo and behold, I told, I sat her down and I said, you got to keep fighting for representation. So when Bon Appetit and other magazines were kind of like flipped on their head, you know, Ileana talked about, was open about some of the experiences that she had with working with periodicals in the food industry. And she really made her presence known. And that was, that was really important because she was at a really low point because people were basically denying her the right to write about her own culture and background, to tell those stories, write those recipes down, to travel, get the I mean, this, it takes money, it takes resources to really do these books right. She went to Hawaii and went to other Puerto Rican communities in America. And, and that's such hard work and it's such a work of love. And, you know, with us, we also have to worry about making sure the words of our elders are preserved. So she was really doing that work, but she had to scream. She had to really vent and make, make it known, make protests known that we simply weren't having those voices. I'm proud to say that she now has this book out paid well for it by the publisher and it's market and it's out right now, but it takes advocacy. And it, sometimes when you don't have the advocacy, advocacy all by yourself, you have to work with other people um, to make sure that the advocacy is done and create community. We can't do this all by ourselves. You know, you know, we have to be able to say, no, 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 no. I'm here to tell my own story and I have the source code. If I have the source code and you don't have the source code, you know, some clubs you can join in, others you got to be born in. I'm so sorry. But for too long, those of us who have been marginalized and oppressed, and that doesn't always come with a racial signifier, we have been forced to let other people tell our story against our will. We don't want that anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask you this. I heard you use the word, uh, the, 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 the phrase, I have to transcend who I am to be deemed useful. And yep. as, you were, as you were saying that, I was thinking through the cooking gene and then through some of your other work, you're showing that our food has to do the same thing. Do you see a parallel between that statement for you and your professional growth and your professional journey and the food that you're um, highlighting? Yeah, because, you know, I focus on historical cooking mm -hmm. and I also look at the connections between different cuisines and just the generic impact of the black food heritage, wherever it may be. Um, but, you know, I would, you know, it was hard for me to even, you know, keep that momentum up because I was asked to write stupid things or, uh, OK, I shouldn't I shouldn't go there. But like, <laughs> go where like, you go. Well, go but, where like, you go. but like sometimes like. Um, I remember people saying, oh, can you write about like some hot Cheetos, macaroni and cheese? I'm like, I would never eat it. So I'm not going to write about it. Uh, <laughs> or they would talk about, it was always like, I don't know, like people were, they wanted me to write a piece about the chopped cheese in New York. And I said, yeah, like I'm, I'm actually, I'm cool with our people, you know, making their little bodega chopped cheese. But when it goes to some some cafe and they're charging $15 for it. That's ridiculous. Um, but I mean, it was always, it was always sort of like, I don't know, white editors' perceptions of what black food was about. And it was never, it was always tongue in cheek. It was always humorous. It was never serious. It was never about the soul or the spirit. It was never about the, the mind and the intellect of the people. It was never about the connections between the people and other groups of people. It was always about these kind of like edgy, outside of whiteness kind of food traditions or food ideas. And, and, and class played a big role in how they perceived those food ideas. And I just didn't want to write that stuff. I said, no, nah, I'm, not, I'm, not I'm not in it. Because it's not that I don't want to help other Black creators 
popularize what they do. But it seemed to me that unless there was some weed in it, or unless <laughs> there was some hot Cheetos or some Hennessy in it, like that was like, wait a minute, there's a certain picture you're developing. And I'm not about respectability politics, but there is a certain picture that you're developing. And I think part of it, honestly, um, um, is that when the cooking I was talking about, the stuff I was talking about required someone to have historical and cultural literacy. Mm. And that's the damn point. The food, the food should lead you to ask questions and get deeper into the people's history and culture and talk about our connections and our information flow. It shouldn't just be an idol unto itself. And because those other things did not require the same amount of emotional, intellectual, and um, you know, inner work. I mean, if you are if you were an average American outside of our culture, you have definitely participated in some aspect of the black presence and black culture, black civilization. But I'm not gonna let you, you know, do no Stephen Miller and sit up in our spaces, grubbing on our food while, while terrorizing our people. No, I'm never gonna let you forget. Ever, 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 ever let ever. you forget. Where, <laughs> who, who you should respect on whose ground you stand and who brought you to the ball and who can ever. burn the ball down if need be. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, it's, I like this comment that this says it seems they want to mock or just laugh instead of truly appreciate the food and its history. Exactly. They wanted things that you know twist a few elements. And I mean, I'm just be honest with you, two white boys who have a little bit of money behind them could turn into a successful food truck business or turn into a show on TV on some on a, on a food network or food network knockoff where they get to look fun and cool. Well, we out here trying to survive. <laughs> like, nah, nah. That, that's just not going to work. Um, you talked about the idea of using food as a food as the ability to reconcile and food as rebellion. Yes. And that seems to be part of, of the, the, the narrative that, that you're, you're, you're putting out. How do you use food as rebellion? Well, that's pretty easy because, you know, <laughs> some of the... <laughs> They would, they would have you think that a barbecue is just the barbecue. When in reality, they did a pig roast in Haiti and it started the Haitian Rebellion. We did a fish fry in Virginia and that started the Gabriel Process Rebellion. They had a barbecue in Southampton County, Virginia, and that started the Nat, the Nat Turner Rebellion. You know, when, when Nanny and them were making war in Jamaica, you know, they were jerking. There's a, there's a, and why is this? Well, you know, you have to ask yourself the question, what's going on? Well, here's the deal. The traditions that all these, these people came from in West Africa, you know, when you went to, went to battle, you went to battle with certain energies and forces with you, you know, Eshu and Ogun, the Yoruba tradition, the, the one in charge of the crossroads and the one in charge of war. These are their sacred foods, you know, to this day, grilled and roasted food are associated with, you know, changing fate and the crossroads. Why is the barbecue man always at the crossroads? <laughs> right? Still to this day, right? To this day. To this that day. Is, this is true in West Africa. It's true in the deep south. You know, that, that roasted meat, that cutlass, that, that metal, that iron, the energy, that force. I mean, there's some deep elements to our culture that we just don't really think about, you know, we all, black folks always surrounded by images and, and, and motifs from cats, not just cats, leopard. You see, even behind me, I, I see. even, even behind me, like the leopard, the cheetah, the lion, the tiger, all these different things. Why? Because our protective, um, our protective, Groups in our traditional culture were the leopard society, or the lion society. That was their traditional police force. Or these animals were seen as avatars of the ancestors protecting us. There's so many symbolic um, and elements that have come down to us. We don't even remember where they came from. So part of my job is to dig those things up, but also to remind people who are trying to appropriate our culture 
and our food or our stories, unless you have that source code, you ain't got no business. Now we can share with you. And if you if you want to make your little version on, on your terms and your space, I can't stop you. That's a lost cause. It might be good, but it ain't going to be as great as mine. Right. But that's fine. You know, you, you know, we all we all kind of make these kind of like little sacrifices, little compromises on our way. But I'll tell you about a success story with cultural appropriation and food, the opposite of cultural appropriation, cultural amplification. Cultural amplification is the opposite of cultural appropriation. So uh, as a fellow I knew, Chris Shepard um, in Houston, at his restaurants before the pandemic, what they would do is he would cook a recipe at his own take on it, put it in his restaurant, but he would also tell the reader, hey, you know where I got the inspiration for this? Houston is a you know, very international city, has a lot of different cultures and backgrounds. And he would talk about the Nigerian, a Vietnamese restaurant that inspired him, the community people. He had a little picture there on the menu, a little address you could go to, you know, support those, those um, other chefs and culinarians in the community. And I thought there was something very special about that because here he was sharing his power, privilege, and platform as a white man in this country with immigrants, with people of color, with helping to amplify them instead of taking on the credit himself. And that is so critical. I mean, part of this is this work is really also acknowledging where the things we take up and use are, no matter what background you come from. I mean, to speak American English is to speak a language that's made up of a lot of other languages. And to eat our cuisine is to eat a cuisine that's made up of a lot of other cuisines, but to a point. And we have to acknowledge that words like authenticity and other stuff, um, they only matter so much. Um, but also there's the idea of protecting the food that we make to say that, oh, no, 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 we can't really, you know, for, I'll give you a good example. People say the word hummus. Like I stopped saying black eyed pea hummus. I make black eyed pea hummus. But I stopped saying that, sorry, black eyed pea dip. Because in Arabic, hummus refers to the Czech pea. And I felt like I was contributing to this devolution of this very unique, specific ethnic food by using hummus in a, in a, in a, in a way that it does, it's not appropriate. Like you see these chocolate, you see chocolate hummus, dessert hummus. There's no such thing. thing. You're, li you're literally saying chocolate chickpea when you say that, but you're also obscuring and erasing an entire culture that has made that food for generations. And no, it's not, and it's not universal in everybody's. It has a as a starting point and it can blossom out into other worlds, but with the caveat that we respect the source. Absolutely respect the recipe, respect the language. What yes. you're talking about, you have to respect the language. Um, you mentioned the idea of, of, we talked about food being rebellion, but I want to ask you about food being, food having the ability to reconcile. But I want to juxtapose rec, uh, reconciliation with uh, acculturation. Okay. And how do you navigate that space? Maybe not you yourself, but how do you see people effectively navigating that space? And how do you see them ineffectively navigating that space where they believe that, I believe that uh, initially they're trying to give honor to a culture. Right. It ends up being something complete. It goes left. It just right. goes left, brother. <laughs> so, you know, um, you know, I meant to say about the rebellion piece that, you know, we have food that's rooted in that. We also have food has played a role in our boycotts. Anti, the anti-slavery movement was largely about, you know, creating boycotts around products that were produced by enslaved labor, including food products mm -hmm. like sugar, cacao, coffee, arrowroot, um, et cetera. Um, also, you know, the places that we ate during the civil rights movement where we had to go to our own establishments and spend money in our own community, places that were sort of protected by surrogation in this way, in a way. And it was at those restaurants in DC, New Orleans, and Baltimore, and Atlanta, and Memphis, and other places where the civil rights movement was crafted. Because those are safe places to meet. And also, the foods that we eat, 
Just the very fact that we say to this day, okra, gumbo, gumbo, banana. We tote, we tote some greens. You know, <laughs> we we you know all these different words that we have. The very fact the recipes and some of the words that survived is resistance because we have complete, could have been completely obliterated. Now to the point of reconciliation and act and, and acculturation and you know all these things. Listen up. Conversation does not mean surrender. Having the conversation does not mean surrender, especially if you know what your chips are in the game. Especially if you know what you have to get out of it. You still have to exist in a multicultural society where we all give and take. So how do you do that? How do you navigate that? First of all, you tell the damn truth. Even when it doesn't make your people look good, you tell the truth. You look for ways of the ways to connect. One of the things that I was really kind of annoyed with when I talked to, and it was I kind of put it put an energy out during the Aquafina situation on social media. I didn't mention her name because it was it was too caustic. I understand why my people get upset about certain things, and I sympathize with us a lot. But I also understood it was a moment where you know I grew up in D.C., D.C. and in, in Baltimore. Um, was close by, and we are, were often there, family stuff, et cetera. And I, I remember that, you know, when I was growing up, people of other backgrounds sort of like got caught up in the salt pepper nexus mm. that they didn't ask for. But it was a very much an established sort of social order. So I grew up with a lot of Aquafinas. I grew up with a lot of Asian people who, you know, talk like us, were friends with us, dated us, married us, had kids with us. And so my point to people was instead of us arguing about a black scent, which I don't know how profitable that is, Asian Americans and African Americans have to have a long conversation about our conflict, our issues, and how we've come together. I got 15 hate tweets for that. Because I had people thinking that calling for a conversation is the same thing as surrender and is not. Not if you hold your own. Not if you know what you stand for, and not if you let people know you will not fall for everything or anything. The so, hate tweets were coming from whom? Uh, oh, mostly us, unfortunately. There mm -hmm. was two Asian people who basically said that, oh, you all are violent towards us, so who cares? And then the rest were from African Americans saying that I shouldn't um, put an olive branch, that, that anti blackness is uh, you know, their problem, we shouldn't have to work for it. I said, anti blackness is our problem too. Are you, are you, are, come on now, come on now, Let, let's be real. But at the same point in time, do I know what's in the heart of every single one of millions of people of East Asian descent on the planet, excuse me, billions on the earth? I don't. Does it mean that a lot of people, unfortunately, have been exposed to anti-blackness? Yes, but so have so have most of us. So my job is to now, figure out ways in which if I'm in close proximity where people are where outside of my bubble, how to affect change. I know that I can affect change. For some of us, we don't we don't want to be the educator all the time. And I understand that. It's exhausting to be black. Exhausting, man. Everybody. It is exhausting. But then again, for some of us, we can't help but do that as a part of our our purpose on earth and part of our work, like me. Mm -hmm. And so I take the, I take the responsibility on but also knowing that we all have to do our part. You know, if I, I don't, I didn't want things to get to the point where, especially at the time when that tweet was being written, there was a lot of violence in the street regarding AAPI people. And my attitude is always that I don't, you know, I want you to come rescue me if I'm in a bad situation. I'm gonna help you out. I'm not gonna ask the question, have you ever said or done something I might find offensive? You're a human being, you're made in the image of God like I am. So it's my job to help you the best I can. Now, if you F that up later on, that's all of the ball game. But the ball game right we're working with right now is in order to be civil members of a multicultural society where we understand we have certain social responsibilities like keeping each other safe and 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 okay, then that's our first job. Not wondering if someone did something offensive in the past or will in the future. 
because we all make mistakes. But at the same point in time, Black Americans in particular, we have to keep our chin up and, and, re and remember that we have the source code to so much of what is called American. If you don't know how African you are, you don't know how Black American you are, you don't know how American you are. Those things are intimately connected. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Um, let me ask you this. I love the fact that you've used food um, essentially as a change agent. One of the things that that our group, one one of the the groups within our honors program, the Mellon Scholars Program, has been taking a look at is food as a political um, device this semester. Mm -hmm. And we we took a look at chocolate. Uh, we took a, we we've taken a look at chocolate in this country. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, chocolate in Mexico, and essentially seeing uh, a lot of the things that you've talked about with food within uh, the Black culture within uh, West Africa coming over to, to Western civilization. When you talk about food, are you talking about it solely as a black person all the time? Or are you talking about people that are disproportionately um, disenfranchised? Um, I would say, if I was gonna give it a measurement, um, two thirds, one third. One third solely rooted in the black tradition. Two thirds marginalized and oppressed people or people who are have have had a had a, a big journey from control to sort of lacking control to having control, somewhat control, and trying to have their message and their meaning and their import given to the world. Um I think that's a that's a fair way to answer the question because I do find myself in dialogue with a lot of people across the board of other queer uh, food people, um, other Jewish food people, other people who are talking about food in Filipino and Palestinian and indigenous Native American cultures, Aboriginal Australian cultures. I mean, we're all doing very similar work. We're trying to rescue and respect the food and traditions of our ancestors, sharing sharing them with the world responsibly, but retaining a, you know a certain amount of empowerment and self acceptance and self healing for ourselves. I mean that's another part that that you know it does. And I and I I, I didn't come up with that. I mean I learned that from different people. I mean I learned about food justice from the, my dear brother Chef Bryant Terry. I learned about the repatriation of certain foods from communities like the Navajo and the Native Hawaiians, where to fight chronic disease and inflammation, people started to ask the question, what are the original foods that sustained us that can heal us and help us in our journey? What are the flavorings, the spices, the fruits, the things from nature, the seasons? How can we look to that to heal ourselves? How can we how can we reapproach that and make it a part of our lives? And for those of us who are part of the African diaspora, I have to say, you know, we came to the we have cultures from West Central Africa that are being introduced to cultures from Western and Southern Europe, where we didn't have the same outlook, the same kind of foods, and so we're dealing with the the consequences of glutinous foods that. We really didn't have the we didn't have the same digestive experience, what shall we say, <laughs> over the course of 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 thousands of years. And I mean, the that we had, well, why why have such inflammation? Why so much chronic illness? Well, we didn't have the vegetable oil, we had no white flour, we had no white sugar, we didn't have all these things in our diet that are problematic for us now. And so I really have had to look at that from my own personal journey. This is just, just this is about the people. It's about me. It's about, you know, when you're black and you're in this country and you wake up one day and you're like, why is everybody in my family sick? Things that are preventable. What can I do to not be going, I mean, going down that, that lane my own self? I mean, I've had those health experiences. Absolutely. I know I, this, this is real. And, it, you know, and I, and I want us to not wait until we're my age, 45, to really pick up on it and understand. We have to start at a very young age. So when we hear activists like Michelle Obama talk about 
healthy eating and food literacy and awareness. This is serious business. But she wasn't the first one to say it, and she shouldn't be the last. She should not be the last. So we really have to um, understand that it takes a lot to sort of raise our own raise our own inner village child, and yeah. we have and being vulnerable and reclaiming your heritage is such an important part of your food experience. Yeah. Thank you. I want to double back to something real quick. You and I agreed on something, but I don't think we teased it out enough. And and if okay. you wouldn't mind going back, when we talked about, you said that you would stop calling hummus, uh, uh, you would stop calling um, black eyed peas hummus, you would start calling it black eyed peas dip. And I, I, I'd like for you to talk about the importance of language and yes. ownership. Um, I think that we may have, have glossed over that too quickly. Why is it so important to you to make sure that uh, language is passed authentically? It's because... You know, I, every time I've gone to the continent, it has hit me like a brick, how much we lost, just in terms of words. Now, it's not to say that Quayo or Patwa or Gullah Geechee or Afro-Brazilian um, idioms and other, and a, you know, Black African-American vernacular English. Do not use the syntax, the grammar, some of the vocabulary. That's that's. I mean, I, I get that. I respect that. I love that about us. But we also lost an incredible amount of power in terms of language. And it didn't hit me until I, again, sometimes you got to look through another lens to get to your own, to get to your own house. Look at, see, see how things are. I remember watching a really beautiful documentary um, about a Native American woman who was um, from um, um, the Wampanoag. And she was becoming a PhD in linguistics because she's reconstructing the language of the Wampanoag people and reteaching it. The Wampanoag, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, are the same um, tribe that the pilgrims, you know, used and later annihil tried to annihilate. And they're uh, now a predominantly, um, they're still here, still thriving with a lot of people who are of African descent in the tribe as well, because um, they fled to them during enslavement. Um, at any rate, her, she was, I remember there's one particular lesson where she was like, you know, the white man says he invented, you know, or saw in the astro you know, astronomy that the earth um, makes a circuit and the planets is it, the, the world is it's, it, that planets move and stars move and that the universe is not necessarily heliocentric, but we're, 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 we're orbiting around the sun. And she showed how in the traditional language, all of that was already a part of it. You know, that stars, that the word for stars was like a moving word. It wasn't just a stationary word. And that she talked about how how they saw the universe and was already implicit in the language. These people were very attuned to the seasons and the heavens, etc. And then I every time I go to West Africa, I'm hearing Mende and Igbo and Yoruba and Tri and Wolof. And I'm going, there is so much we're missing here. So much. You know, you go from all of that to a language that uses, I don't know how many terms to describe negative things in terms of blackness and positive things in terms of whiteness and lightness. But, you know, I try, one thing I've tried to do in my work as a culinary historian, as a researcher, is to really learn the words around food, descriptors, um, nouns, verbs, expressions, proverbs in each culture, I mean, as much as I can possibly learn so that I can really begin to sort of reconstruct the mindset. I can't do every single word and every single thing in every culture. That's impossible. Right. But I can go into the food culture of those different West African societies and civilizations and say, okay, what got translated? What got passed on? 
what is lingering in the back of our consciousness and what is at the forefront of it. And the reason why I do that is because, you know, what's so special and so beautiful about us is that we've been able to construct an ethereal language that we don't even need words for. You know, it was like going on the podcast last night and we started telling stories and my eyes started to roll in my head and look up and down and we were already laughing because we understood there are nonverbal cues in the way we communicate that are that are so much more to the point than anything in direct English speech. But, you know, the other element of it, of course, is, you know, having the appropriate language means having the appropriate result. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Last question. I want to be a respect of your time. Sure. You are amazing. What is next for Michael Twitty? Well, Kosher Soul is out right now. I have yes. to work on a 400 recipe cook Bible cookbook of the American South um, with a big emphasis on, you know, what we brought to the table. Um, and we're also working on another book about Black food tradition and culture um, for the for the next generation, for the next generation. And then I'm also working on a book about um, the LGBTQ presence in the American kitchen. So I have a lot of projects that have taken me through the next three, three to four years to get through. And then, you know, hopefully they'll be of use to the young folks now who want to make sure they don't mess up dinner. That's a, that's a big deal. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get y'all special um, permission to make that potato salad. So we'll see what happens. As long as you ain't putting no raisins in it. I know it's going to oh, be amazing. Lord. Lord <laughs> Don't don't say that. They might write that down. <laughs> Listen, I think this has been a joy. Thank you. Thank you, brother. I sincerely appreciate you. Hey, this is this is. I'm so sorry. I'm not in my my homeland of Maryland. Yeah. You know, but let uh, us know next time you're doing a cooking demonstration. We will absolutely. Bring we will absolutely. Bring I would love that. It's, you know, the thing that I'm most excited and most happy is talking to our young people. Um, those of you who are sitting out there who are students of all ages, I just want you to know something. Like seeing seeing your faces and hearing your stories of your family and hearing the connections that you make, that excites me, it makes me so proud because it means that somebody is passing on the culture. And this is why we do this work. We do this not for ourselves, but for our ancestors and for our descendants. Ashe. Thank you. You have a great evening, brother. Thank you. Thank you, y'all. Y'all take care and be safe.